Well, happy Father's Day. What? Thank you. I, I know what it is, dads. You're jealous, right? You're jealous because I am the best dad ever. So I understand the uh, competition there. So I heard somebody say not too long ago, it would be funny to see two dads wearing a shirt, each of them having the best dad ever or number one dad and letting them duke it out to see which one gets to keep that title of best dad ever. Uh, Speak for yourself. (laughs) I'll see you in the parking lot, buddy. (laughs) Never mind, I'm just kidding. He accepted the challenge and now I'm running away. Run away, run away, run away. Uh, If you've noticed tonight, uh, we turned on the heater. What we wanted to do tonight is show you what it would be like in hell. And uh, so, no, we are, uh, we had an air conditioner fail this week. And so I see that many of you are fanning. If you feel the need to get up uh, and and stretch or walk to the back of the room, do that. We don't want anyone to have heat stroke, uh, but uh, we're working on that, getting the air conditioner fixed. This weekend, we're in the middle of our sermon series called Upside Down, and we're really focusing on the words of Jesus uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus had a lot of things to say. Uh, He had a lot of wise words for us. And if we, as his followers, are able to apply his word to our life, really, if we were really to apply his word to our life, it would actually turn our lives upside down. It would change the way we speak to our children. It would change the way we work at, at, at our work. It would change the way we vacation. It would change our downtime. It would change everything about our relationships if we applied them to our lives. And so I would ask this question, do you really want your life turned upside down? Do you really want Jesus to change you and transform you? Are you really wanting that for your life? Have you ever stopped to think about how often you wanted to win the approval of other people? Uh, If you've ever been interviewed for a job, you wanted to impress the potential employer, didn't you? Uh, Maybe you brushed up on the buzzwords or you, you looked at things a little bit differently. You were more intense, but you wanted their approval. If you've ever submitted an application for a university or for a college, you wanted to receive approval through the administration or through the process. Uh, If you've ever proposed to your spouse, you wanted their approval. I think you wanted their approval. Uh, you want, we, want to, we seek approval for car loans. We seek approval for mortgages. We seek approval for almost everything that we do in life. Now, you may say that you don't seek the approval of other people, but I would push back on that, and I would say that in our culture, yes, we do. We do seek the approval of other people, hence the rise and success of Facebook right? Hence the success of social media platforms. We like to be retweeted or we like to be liked. I got a notification from Facebook today that said, I have now earned 100,000 likes from my friends on Facebook, right? Winning the approval of other people, we do seek after it. I'm a follower of Jesus. That means that I have trusted Jesus to be my savior. That means I became a born again Christian. It means that I was made new, brand new. It means that God is never going to hold my sin uh, over my head and say, remember that time when you did that. God has already given me approval, not based on what I've done, but based on what Jesus did for me. I've not earned God's approval. God approved me through mercy and he approved me through grace. So why is it that I too struggle with seeking the approval of others? I I so often grow concerned about what other people think about me. Do they approve of me? Am I fitting in? Would they like me if they knew the real me? Uh, I I like country music. Uh, Unashamedly, I listen to any other country music fans in that. Okay, great. Okay, good. Okay. All right. (laughs) Never mind. I started to say something really worldly like a joke. So... Uh, but I, I like country music. I like songs about fighting, cussing, drinking. Can you say, you know what cussing is, right? Okay. 
Cussing, drinking, cheating, trucks, love, family. I mean, I like those types of songs. You've heard what happens when you play country music backwards, right? You get your wife back, you get your job back, you get your dog back. Now, now the tension that I have when it comes to country music is because sometimes the lyrics I love the most are about sinful things. Uh, I'm not only a born-again follower of Jesus, but I'm also a pastor, and there are certain behavioral expectations that culture sometimes places on a pastor. If you grew up in the South or in a traditional church, you were trained to think that pastors are not supposed to enjoy country music. They're not supposed to have a nice house. They're not supposed to have, uh, uh, they're not supposed to be sarcastic. They're not supposed to drive fast. They're not supposed to preach in beards or preach in jeans or wear t-shirts as they preach. Most pastors that I know lead publicly, but they have felt that squeeze that often leads to burnout because they can never meet the expectations of their church members. And they stop resting in winning or having the approval of God. They stop resting in that and they begin to seek the short-term satisfaction of winning the approval of other people. And the truth is, I'm just like them. Uh, The truth is I I am a hypocrite. Uh, The truth is that I I want to be approved by people as well. As much as I would like to say, nope, I don't care what you think. This is what God wants us to do or or this is how God has approved. This is the direction that we're going. Uh, I want people to get on board. I want to win the approval of others. I could listen to country music all the way from my house to the church campus. And when I get to the church campus, the first thing I do is reach over and turn the station to like worship songs. All all the kids are, you know, at CCA, all the kids are getting out and they're, they're all dressed up in their uniforms and they're lining up and they're going into their classrooms. And I pull up, if I'm blaring Johnny Cash or if I'm blaring, you know, something else that's talking about drinking or cheating, I feel kind of creepy, right? And so I just reach over and I'll turn it on to a worship song and lift my hands in the air as I pull in. (laughs) Why do I do that? Because I want people to think the best of me. That's that's what I want. Uh, And the best of me, having people think the best of me is not accurate. It doesn't accurately capture who I am. Uh, The truth is, I do listen to Christian music. I love Lauren Daigle and David Crowder, Lecrae, Skillet. I love those Christian artists, but that is not the only music that I listen to. And if church family is going to know anything about my musical preference, I want them to think that I listen mostly to Christian music. And sadly, the reason is because God's approval is not enough for me. Can you relate to that sin? Can you relate to that sin in your life? Uh, Are there things that you do to win the approval of other people? Raise your hand if you've ever given your house a deep cleaning when the in-laws were coming over. (laughs) Right? Uh, Raise your hand if you've ever bought new clothes for that job interview. Okay. Raise your hand if you washed your car before going out on that first date. Right? Why? Why do we do those things? Because we want to win the approval of other people. We want other people to be pleased with how we live. And Jesus often criticized the Pharisees and the religious leaders for doing things to win the approval of others. In our main passage of scripture, it's found on page 946 in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, please take one of the Bibles underneath the seats in front of you home. We want you to have it. It's our gift to you. But on page 946, we're going to, or 964, we're going to read this passage of scripture where Jesus was criticizing the Pharisees and the religious leaders because they did things to win the approval of others. Jesus addresses the public life of a follower of Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. 
See, we have forgotten that we have a God or that we serve a God and that this God knows us that sees us in our secret times. He sees us when we do good. He sees us when we do right things. We've forgotten that. And because we've often forgot that, we fall into that slippery slope of beginning to let other people know when we do good things. We have a church that loves to serve on mission locally in the schools and in the city and globally around the world. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to say that roughly 22 cents of every dollar that is given goes towards mission work around the world. That is amazing and it's almost unheard of in Southern Baptist churches today. We talk about that. We talk about our giving. We talk about the life change that we see happening in other countries as a result of the faith of God's people here and as a result of the love of God's people here. We see how God is using our church around the world and locally. But when we do those good works and we talk about those good works, we have to begin to ask the question based on this passage of Scripture, what is my motivation? What is my motivation when I'm doing these good works? What is my motivation when I am serving or when I'm giving? Why do you serve on the first impressions team? Why do you serve in the deacon ministry? Why do you serve as a life group leader? Why do you serve on the worship team or volunteer in the kids ministry? Are your motivations pure or could it be that you really want to be seen by other people? Could it be that you really want to be viewed as a leader? See, there's nobody else that knows the answer to that question. That, that answer really rests between you and God. God alone knows why you volunteer. God alone knows why you give. So what is your motivation? Is it pure? Now, Jesus is not teaching that we should not do public works. He is addressing the motivation that many people have in that passage where it says, in order to be seen by them. There is something lurking within all of us that sin is trying to earn the approval of other people. We can best see that in an illustration uh, such as basketball. Now, I love the Golden State Warriors. I think they're a fun team to watch. Uh, I like Steph Curry. I, I believe that he's a believer in Jesus. He's a follower of Christ, but he sure is cocky, isn't he? I mean, he, he, when he makes one of those three-point shots when it's at the end of the game and he hits it, and, I mean, he just raises his hands up in the air and he kind of looks at the crowd like, I'm the best. Kind of like wearing a best dad in the world shirt, right? Like, I'm the best. There's none better than me. And we see that happen often with athletes and with basketball players and they smile and they spin around in awe of themselves. Jesus doesn't want followers of Jesus to live like that when we're serving him and when we're giving and when we're volunteering in many ways. Now, you might say that you've never done such a thing like that. You would never boast about serving. Well, let me ask you this, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but have you ever boasted about going on a mission trip? Have you ever been in conversation with somebody and say, oh yeah, I went on a mission trip and you know, we, we, uh, we were serving in an orphanage or we were serving uh, by uh, doing construction or we were doing evangelism in India or whatever it, context it was. And did you tell them that to make yourself feel good? Well, that's boasting. Or have you ever wore church clothes to church because that's a style that other people wear? Have you ever done that? You ever thrown on back in the South when, you know, we would wear a suit and ties and things like that to church? Why? Because that was the cultural expectation. Well, what about shorts and sandals? Is that what you're wearing to church to win the approval of other people to fit in? Do you have a Bible placed in a prominent spot in your house so that when the pastor comes over or other people come over, they can think that you're a holy person? You've got the Bible placed in a prominent spot. Now, the Bible has three layers of dust on it, right? The Bible hasn't been used, but it's there just in case somebody comes over. Or have you ever boasted about the giving to the church, financially supporting the church with a hope that they might feel like you're somebody special, that the church can't do without you? 
Now, if your motives are pure, you'll realize that there's no need to boast about serving or what you've given, what you've worn, how you've served as a public follower of Jesus. If my motives are pure, I should not have to worry about what other people think about me. And I shouldn't have to change the radio station if my motives are really pure. If my motives are pure, I shouldn't have to worry about those things and you shouldn't have to worry about those things because God has never asked me to impress others. See, I can't find anywhere in Scripture that the pastor is supposed to impress people. I can't, I can't find anywhere in Scripture that a follower of Jesus is supposed to impress other people with his godly lifestyle. I can't find one passage of Scripture uh, do you boast about church attendance? Do you brag about your quiet times? Do you often tell people about how many days in a row you've had that walk with the Lord where you've read your Bible and you've journaled and you've talked with him? Do you boast about how much scripture you might have memorized? Uh, do you boast about abstaining from alcohol, cigarettes, or pornography? I mean, are there things in your life that you boast and brag about? See, I can't find one passage of Scripture where God asks us to impress each other with our godliness. Not one. It's not there. In fact, we see just the opposite in Philippians 2, 3. The Apostle Paul wrote these words. He said, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. So what I would say to you is, so stop. If you brag, if you boast, if you tell others about how good you are and you, you shine the light on your good works, just stop doing it. See, we, we're not in competition with one another. In fact, I'm going to tell you a secret. I often think much less about people when they say something like, do you know how much I've given to that church? Do you know how much I volunteered at that church? I did my time serving in student ministry. I've done my time serving in the nursery. Do you know how my opinion of other people when they say things like that goes completely bottom? And that's like, you're okay with that because you don't care what I think about you, right? But, but when people start boasting, 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 when people start boasting and bragging about what they've done for God, I just feel sorry for them and think they just don't get it. We're not called to impress other people with our good looks. We're called to, with our good looks, with our good works. <laughs> Hang on, let me take a selfie. <laughs> yeah, I won't be preaching for a while. So what has God asked us to do as a follower of Jesus? If God doesn't want us to impress others, what has he asked us to do? Well, the reality is God has asked me to impact other people. Matthew 5, 16 and John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus teaches us that our faith should not be a private thing. He's not teaching us that we ought not do good works. He's in fact teaching us that no, go and do good works. Go and make a difference. Go and impact the world in my name. Step out in faith, do awesome things. The faith of a follower of Jesus ought to be visible. You see, if you're, if you're, uh, if you became a follower of Christ by trusting in him as your Savior and Lord, and nobody can tell that you're a follower of Jesus, something's not right. Our, our faith ought to be visible. I, I will never forget when Kentucky Senator Rand Paul was running for the office of the President of the United States, and the talking heads in the media were talking about his faith. They were trying to figure out what he really believed about Jesus. They were, they were thinking about it. They were wrestling with it. They were talking about it. And finally, in an interview, Rand Paul was asked about his faith. And his answer made me sick. He said, and I quote, that I think faith is a private matter. See, he could not have been more wrong when it comes to faith. Our faith in Jesus is a very public matter. Now, it needs to be handled correctly. It's not done in a braggy way. Chad told me that braggy wasn't a word. Everyone say braggy. braggy. How are words formed, right? 
Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Our good works bring glory to God. On one hand, Jesus is saying, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And on the other hand, Jesus is saying, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And the only way that our good works can shine before men is if our sinful, boastful self isn't tarnishing the shine of what we do. Right, we got to get out of the way and we've just simply got to do those good works that we were created to do. The good works that people see me do impacts them. The good works changes them. How can somebody glorify God apart from being a follower of Christ? Jesus is saying in this passage that our good works can cause other people to bring glory to God. And that means our good works can lead other people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, it's that simple. That that's why we were created is to do those good works that he planned before the world was uh, formed. That's what we're called to do. At Calvary, we hear positive statements from our community all the time. They see how we love our teachers and our schools uh, through the way that we serve. They see the way we love our community through serving at community events. They see what we're doing. We make an impact on them, and the church continues to grow. But we don't do those things because we feel obligated to. We don't do those things because we feel like, well, that's what they think we need to be doing. Or... We don't do those things because we're looking for some type of reward. We're not even doing those things because we want to see the church grow. Everybody wants a growing church. Everybody wants a thriving church. Do we want our church to grow? Yes, but that is not why we serve our community. You see, we serve and impact our community because we love our community. We serve on missions around the world because we love the people that God has created. And we serve in such a way that our love for them comes across. They know that we are not serving in that capacity or serving in that way to get recognition. We're serving in that way because we love. See, I impact others through life-changing love. 1 Corinthians 13, 3 says, If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. 13, 13 says, So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. When you serve, when you give, when you volunteer, When you do good works, is it out of obligation? Is it out of guilt? Is it because nobody else is doing it? Or is it because you genuinely love other people? See, if we are building our foundation of ministry and service on love, then what we do will have eternal significance. What we do will have an eternal impact. If you're involved in missions, if you're involved in service because of love, then you will make an eternal impact. And as you make that eternal impact, God will reward you, whether it be in heaven or whether it be here on this earth. But you do it without a boastful spirit. You do it without pride. You do it in a humble way, not trying to win the approval of other people. If my motivation is to impress others, to receive appreciation and gratitude, or to demonstrate to others how wonderful a person I am, then I gain nothing in the process. I don't make a godly impact. I make a temporary impact that does not lead to life change. So we serve because we love others. We give because we love others. We pray because we love others. We live to love other people. We bring life change to people through loving them. Yes, sometimes it's through sharing God's word with them. Yes, sometimes it's through preaching. Yes, sometimes it's through teaching. But we make the most significant impact when we do all those things that we do as a church, but it's all motivated by love. 
So let me ask you a question. Are you known as a follower of Jesus because of your church attendance or because of your tips? Are you known as a follower of Jesus because of the, your church attendance or because of the way you live in our community? Do people know you by your love? Jesus said, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Are you demonstrating love? Are you motivated by love? Are you practicing impacting the world around you by love? My prayer is that we would all be known publicly as followers of Jesus because of the love that we have for one another, for the Lord, and for the lost world around us. Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that your love is what changes us. You chose to love us. You poured your love out upon us. Lord, you, you satisfied our debt of sin on the cross. Thank you. Lord, we ask that tonight you would stir in our hearts a genuine love for you that cannot be shaken growing love for one another inside our church family and for those outside our church family who are not yet followers of Jesus. Help us to love as we ought to love. Help us to give as we ought to give with pure motives coming from a pure heart, coming from a fully devoted heart toward you. Help us to grow in Jesus' name. Amen.